boasting of a high-frequency, high-energy pulsed torus rotating at high speed. What is complicated is in the ways the energies go about twisting the quantum vacuum and ultimately the fabric of space-time. So just how feasible is Musha's gravity machine? Well, all the math, including what's already in general relativity, as well as the data from experiments with fluid dynamics, indeed all seem to support the concept. Based on all the data, I would venture to say it's a yes. Indeed, it is feasible. As already stated, there is sound evidence that supports the validity of this concept, such as the general relativity states that any rotating mass frame drags, twists in this case, the surrounding space-time directly, resulting in a so-called gravitomagnetic field. The Gravity Probe B satellite confirmed that the Earth does indeed twist the surrounding space-time. The extreme energy density of the quantum vacuum and physical and especially mathematical similarities between fluid dynamics and the quantum vacuum. Also, it's worth considering that the coil does not need to be entirely superconducting. If the bulk of its mass in the form of coaxial condenser were instead high-density plasma, we would perhaps achieve rotation rates close to those needed. An exciting prospect indeed. And don't forget Mush's proposal from his paper on the jump drive of actually reducing an object's mass by depleting the quantum vacuum. Will we be making use of anti-gravity machines in the near future? Who knows? However, on a theoretical and technical level, it appears that within the next, perhaps, five to ten years, we will have some form of crude anti-gravity. Basically, we already possess the understanding and most of the technologies. That said, several key aspects of the machine remain to be developed. Could SpaceX do it? Why not? Is the desire there? Yes and no. We'll see. Could we serve as technical advisors? Absolutely. After being neglected for decades, spaceflight is now finally coming back around. And this time, it looks like it's here to stay. Docking request granted. More and more, companies and countries are realizing that spaceflight can be a profitable commercial enterprise. It's only a matter of time before we have routine flights to and from the moon. We'll soon have the equivalent of railways and ocean liners in space. But this lacks the personal freedom granted by cars and private aircraft. What we're missing at this point are the personal spacecraft. Welcome to a station. And as it turns out, the technologies that might enable personal spacecraft will also make spaceflight in general so inexpensive and safe that we'll finally get a Star Wars-like future. First, however, we must overcome some challenges before we can get our real Millennial Falcons or X-Wings. Mustn't all the heroes of fiction overcome challenges to win their prize? Docking successful. Engines disengaged. First and foremost, our greatest challenge is the lack of a single-staged orbit and reusable spacecraft. To quote Winchell Chung of Atomic Rockets, whose work has proven invaluable to this video, no self-respecting space cat wants to go into space to top a disintegrating totem pole. Price is actually a secondary concern, as single-staged orbits, spacecraft are much more easily made reusable, and therefore, among other reasons, much less expensive to operate. Eventually, economies of scale would reduce the price of reusable craft, especially if they could fly as one piece, but with disintegrating and expendable craft, this is more difficult. If we'd had reusable single-stage spacecraft for the past decade, then there would already be commercial space liners, at least for orbit and rapid suborbits, and some wealthy individuals would by now have their own private space liners, which would count as personal spacecraft. Thirdly, we have the problem of actually reaching another planet. Who wants a personal spacecraft that can only reach orbit? And lastly, we find difficulties posed by the lack of gravity and the high radiation of outer space. We'll come back to this later. For now, we'll instead focus on the single stage, price, and interplanetary aspects. Over the years, there have been many attempts to design single stage spacecraft. Of those that might have worked, a single stage was managed either by brute force with a powerful enough engine, such as the Orion, the old firecracker under a tin can, or more commonly, by just barely limping into space with a relatively tiny payload. Many of today's rockets could actually just barely reach orbit with a single stage, 
but they end up using second state anyway, so they can carry worthwhile payloads. The most promising approach has proven to be space planes, though until recently they too could hardly carry much in the way of a payload in orbit, or else must use a second stage rocket deployed at maximum altitude. Beginning the 1990s, uh, and with a new flurry of activity starting less than a decade ago, new designs have cropped up, from the Hotol to and its descendant in the Skylon, to seemingly more exotic designs like Russia's magnetohydrodynamically augmented scramjet, the IX. Scramjets in particular are appealing, as they can potentially attain speeds approaching orbital velocity. Scramjets also have the nifty property of being able to reach the uppermost reach of the atmosphere, only running dry when the air does. This is unlike conventional jet engines, which cannot function in the thin atmosphere found at such altitudes. Scramjets are a variant of ramjets, and as with all ramjets, motion through the atmosphere drives the needed air into the engines, which also compresses the air to the densities needed for efficient combustion. Scramjets, on the other hand, they allow the airstream to remain supersonic throughout the engine, and therefore must maintain a relatively inefficient combustion in the supersonic airstream. It's analogous to trying to keep a candle lit in a hurricane. To manage this, scramjets must be specifically designed for supersonic combustion, and therefore must be accelerated to supersonic speeds before they can function. So, a space plane would allow us to make a single stage spacecraft that lifts off and flies as one piece. In other words, we'll be flying X-Wings, or perhaps Naboo Starfighters. We don't just want a single-staged orbit, we want to be able to fly to other planets. Not much of an X-Wing if it can't even reach the moon. A personal spacecraft is going to need to carry its own propellant for this, as a space air is, well, non-existent. How much propellant will depend on how efficient the craft's engines are. Starting with basics, will chemical engines cut the mustard? That depends on what we want. Given that a scramjet would need very little propellant to reach orbit, compared with what's required to reach another planet, a real-life X-Wing, scramjet of course, could perhaps manage to fly to Mars. Surprising, huh? The thing is, the delta-v change in velocity needed to reach orbit is, on its own, half of the delta-v needed to reach Mars, or indeed almost anywhere. Delta-v-wise, orbit is halfway to anywhere, or just about at least. Now that we have a basic design, how much could this conceptual aerospacecraft cost to buy? Spacecraft and aircraft are similar enough in the construction techniques and required tolerances. Liners cost roughly 2 million USD per ton of cargo capacity. The rough aerospacecraft design that we have here has a cargo capacity of 15 metric tons, although we also roughed out a 2 tonner for thoroughness. These two designs would cost roughly 30 million and 4 million USD respectively. A bit expensive, but not completely out of reach either. MHD and 3D printing could both reduce the price tag, perhaps by half optimistically, or at least a quarter off. So, for perhaps 4 million USD you could, in the near future, own a spacecraft that could fly anywhere on Earth and all the way to the Moon or Mars. Not too bad. If you're going to head out for the Moon or Mars, you're going to need radiation protection and gravity. There are three main, potentially achievable methods of providing gravity. The first is spin gravity, the second is thrust gravity, and the third would be gravitomagnetism, no relation to electromagnetism, as discussed in our previous video. If you have a personal spacecraft at least 10 meters, 33 feet in breadth at its widest point, at least 2 meters, 6.5 feet in height, then we could actually fit a small centrifuge inside. It wouldn't be large enough to supply Martian or Terran gravity, but it will manage a bit less than lunar gravity. Another option is actually make some part of the spacecraft, such as the fuel propellant tankage, detachable. The detached part would remain attached by a tether. It would then be spooled out a ways, and the whole system spun up until it was whirling like a bola. This way, the effective diameter of the spinning system is increased, so a higher gravity can be managed for a lower spin rate, even towards the floor if desired. Now, if we want thrust gravity, then we'll need an engine with simultaneously high thrust and high efficiency. In this case, chemical engines will most definitely not cut the mustard. Chemical rockets may have high thrust, so I'm even managing a thrust-to-weight ratio of 150 to 1, but they are monstrously inefficient. Ion engines, on the other hand, have very high efficiencies, but pitiful thrust. A piece of paper exerts about as much force on your hand as an ion engine. It would appear that we have no option but to turn to fission, fusion, or antimatter. And in the long run, that will indeed be the case. Spacecraft for the next decade and onward will fly on beams of superheated plasma, heated by the might of fusion or antimatter. For now though, we have another possibility aside from antimatter fusion and even fission. Metallic hydrogen. Recently, researchers showed, mathematically, that metallic hydrogen may be metastable, like diamond. And they say diamonds are forever. If this turns out to be true, then we might just have a chemical means of propulsion with both high thrust and high efficiency. It looks like the exhaust velocity, and therefore efficiency, of metallic hydrogen rocket is too low to manage a significant acceleration to even the moon. 
One of the primary factors behind the exhaust velocity is the temperature inside the combustion slash reaction chamber. The reaction chamber temperature in turn depends on the pressure inside. We get a temperature of some 7000 Kelvin with a chamber pressure of 100 atmospheres. It stands to reason that a chamber with a higher pressure, such as around 500 atmospheres, will produce a higher temperature, perhaps on the order of 10,000 Kelvin or hotter. With this, we could build a metallic hydrogen rocket engine with an efficiency on pars with a closed cycle gas core nuclear thermal rocket, known as a nuclear light bulb. Assuming that this can be achieved, let's say we have a personal aerospace craft, AX-15, with a cargo capacity of 15 metric tons, a dry mass of 40 metric tons, including a full load of cargo, so that 15 tons, and a wet mass of 200 metric tons. Alternatively, we could have a two-tonner craft with a dry mass of 6 metric tons and a wet mass of 30 metric tons with identical delta V to the 15-tonner. Either craft could potentially manage a 13-hour flight to the moon with a continual acceleration of 7% of Earth's gravity. Half the moon's gravity. Not much gravity, but it shows the feasibility. Perhaps even higher pressures be used, and with it a higher thrust gravity and shorter transit time. Of course, there's also the ultra-dense deuterium we mentioned a few videos back. If that pans out, then the aerospacecraft could simply mount such a reactor instead of using a metallic hydrogen. On a related note, metallic hydrogen is efficient enough to allow for purely rocket-based single-stage spacecraft. One just wonders what might be possible by combining a scramjet with metallic hydrogen in an oxygen-rich atmosphere, with MHT to boot. Now we could use a controversial method, proposed by Dr. Mush and colleagues. The one with the rotating superconductor. Which, however... Now we come to the sticky problem of radiation. For this, we can either use passive material radiation shielding, or active field-based radiation shielding. For the passive, it appears that layered plastic and metal foils with a thickness of 30 centimeters a foot or less would reduce the radiation levels of interplanetary space to Earth normal levels. It's turning out to be very important to protect ourselves from radiation in deep space, as recent research has shown that beyond an increase in cancer risk, radiation can cause brain damage which leads to Alzheimer's symptoms later on in life. At a foot thick, this layered plastic metal foils would prove heavy and massive. Even at 15 centimeters, 6 inches, such material shielding would still be heavy. That said, with the propulsion systems that we've been considering, such bulky radiation shielding may not be infeasible. Now, active shielding, perhaps paired with passive shielding, is quite promising indeed. A NASA study found that 10 kilowatts could power combined electromagnetic and electric fields that would more or less completely protect a spacecraft from cosmic and solar radiation. 10 kilowatts is close to the average daily power consumption by UK and US households. Keep in mind that we're talking about using MHD for atmospheric propulsion, so why not use it for radiation shielding as well? It could be quite effective. We could also do something else. The best radiation shielding against the proton rain of the solar wind is hydrogen and hydrogen-rich compounds. This is because the hydrogen atoms being a single proton orbited by a single electron have nearly the same mass as the incoming protons. Therefore, just as with two equal mass billiard balls, the hydrogen atom and proton rebound as much as possible. The hydrogen atom, of course, is embedded in a bulk material, so the rebound is absorbed and taken up, while the incoming protons simply bounce off and away. Keeping this in mind, were we not just discussing using metallic hydrogen as a fuel? Why not play the spacecraft with this lightweight metal? Metallic hydrogen is pretty much the densest form of hydrogen, except for maybe ultra-dense deuterium. Deuterium is a hydrogen isotope. MHD, metallic hydrogen, single stage from Earth's surface to Mars. This is smelling like a typical sci-fi space fighter. So maybe we'll call this concept a space flyer. So, when do we see such personal spacecraft? It would appear that personal spacecraft may be feasible within a decade to a decade and a half, given the current rate of development. Only time will tell. And with that, let's wrap up. And with that, let's wrap up this video. To recap, scramjets are amazing and let us reach space and even the moon or Mars, all in one go and as one piece. Expect price tags on the order of a couple of million to a few million for a small runabout or day cruiser, and in the lower tens of million for a small cargo hauler. A personal spacecraft all of some 10 meters 33 feet across could fit a centrifuge capable of nearly lunar gravity, or it could whirl itself around like a bola. Metallic hydrogen might have just enough of a kick to allow thrust gravity to the moon. Also, scramjets and metallic hydrogen make a potent mix. Fusion would improve everything. Dr. Mush and colleagues' gravity machine could theoretically provide near lunar gravity, and do so without needing that much energy and with a fairly reasonable spin rate. Scramjets and or metallic hydrogen can make relatively heavy physical radiation shielding feasible. Active shielding may have a low enough power requirements to be a feasible option, and can be combined with passive shielding for even better results. 
MHD atmospheric propulsion can be theoretically adapted as radiation shielding. Metallic hydrogen may make for lower mass physical radiation shielding. And there you have it. Are personal spacecraft feasible, and when might we have them? It appears that, yes, surprisingly enough, personal spacecraft are feasible, and that we might have them within a decade or so. Or sooner. And that concludes this video. We want to thank all of our patrons and viewers for helping to support us.